Hey, welcome everybody. It's Steve with Tan Books coming at you with again with Father Kirby on another oh, it was an author spotlight. Though he didn't author this book, the author is deceased. Uh, Rick was kind of Padre for him, uh, saying how Mary for his eternal soul. But Father knows the book and said he liked it and, lo- and knows it backwards and forwards, upside and down in four different languages. Maybe I'm exaggerating. So, Father, <laughs> appreciate you coming on on this and thank you for being up for this book. Yes, thank you. I appreciate the invitation. No, no, and again, we as we talked last time, he fathers a uh, 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 what branch? Uh, Army National Guard. Army. I was going to say Army, but I didn't want to uh, insult you and say Navy was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So yes, yes. No, no, no. Go. What were you going to say? Oh, I was going to say, and not only um, that, that, that I serve in the Army National Guard, but comparatively in terms of uh, my family. I kind of went on, on the lighter end, uh, so I felt uh, obviously a call to, to serve, to give back. So I served uh, six years in, in the Army National Guard, but my father's retired military, my brother's retired military, my uncle's retired military. One of my nephews right now is in Fort Stewart, Georgia, in, in serving in the Army. One of my other nephews is actually in Fort Sill right now, going through basic training, about to enter uh, the Army. So. You can imagine my entire family, my background, my life has been thoroughly imbued with the United States Army. So, comparatively, in terms of my family, my family, family members and stuff, uh, I, you know, I was, uh, they say, the weekend warrior. Uh, but I served and was, ha- and I was happy to serve. Uh, and if I ever needed, I would be happy to to serve again. But, um, but, I just want to emphasize to the viewers, like my whole life. Is, has been the military, which is why when you mentioned this book, I said I to talk about priesthood and priests who served in military as chaplains. Like yes, 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 <laughs> that's a no-brainer. <laughs> so, um, so I'm excited about our conversation today. Yeah, and no, full disclosure, I never served, but we were. Uh, I remember after uh, I think it was December 2011, Dad was state we were at the uh, Marines uh, uh, office going to try to sign up for OTC school. And then Dad pulled us away, said, "All right, we fought in enough wars. We traced our lineage back to, on his side, to the Tennessee militia. So we had every male in our family back into the Tennessee militia times. Uh, Dad was in Vietnam, which got me peaked on this book was the movie uh, Last Full Measure about the per- uh, PJ jumper. I forget his name right now, but it was a great movie. And as Father mentioned about tying him to priesthood, that's all I could see in that movie was." There was a guy at the, what happened was the medic got killed. He's in the uh, helicopter looking down and goes, they need me down there. They're lost without me. And their motto is, you know, St. Michael's motto in the back or logo in the background. And then their motto is uh, that others may live. And these heroic Catholic chaplains, as the book name is, they did this so that others may live. Amen. Um, yes. So obviously we got the ones that most people know about. I guess we could start with those guys, like Vincent Capardono oh. and. Yes, yes, yes. So, so first, if if I can give kind of a, a lead in in that, uh, yeah. I think it's so important that as as Catholics in particular, uh, but all people, all Americans, all people of goodwill need to know the good priests. That the vast, vast majority of Catholic priests are are good men who have said yes to a call in order to selflessly serve, to lay down their lives in service to others. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, obviously with the recent scandals and then some of the, uh, you know, doctrinal confusion and, and various things. And, and we see, you know, an exodus of young priests leaving today because they're so discouraged uh, or, or confused in terms of priestly identity or what it means uh, to be a Catholic priest uh, in the midst of the church today, in the midst of the world today. So I think it's so important that we highlight and emphasize these exemplary priests who reflect the vast majority of priests in their parishes, the university uh, campuses, you know, uh, hospitals, uh, prisons, and various things of the vast majority. Because uh, if anyone else <laughs> needs to rally around the priests, it's our own. Uh, I, I've sometimes commented in the past uh, to my congregation, especially when a particular parishioner uh, might have been particularly uh, disrespectful, mm-hmm. I will say that there are times in my priesthood, I've been a priest almost 14 years, where I am shown more respect by the unbeliever in public society than by a Catholic believer, uh-huh. you know, and I call our own to task. I say, you will not speak to a priest that way. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like, you know, and sometimes it catches people off guard because you know we're so egalitarian in America, where everyone's the same, everyone's you know equal, and certainly we're all equal in dignity. 
but there are offices, and especially as Catholics, we understand there are divinely appointed offices, which means our priests are fallen, they're weak, they have their sinfulness, but in the midst of it, they are the ones chosen by God to lead the church in his name. So, as I've said, call me on my on my faults. You know, if I was too abrupt or impatient, sure, I'd be the first to apologize because I want to be holy and get to heaven. Uh, but the other part is, you know, don't try to use that in order to dismiss the authority that's been given to me or the authority I attempt in my fallenness to exercise in Christ's name. So I, I'm just happy with books like this because, you know, Steve, we just don't tell our story well. Like there are so many aspects of our tradition, of our heroes, of our saints that I don't, don't even know. Mm-hmm. And it's thinking, this is something to be proud of. I mean, there are parts of the book on our military chaplain. I was getting choked up. You know, I'm thinking that's what it means to be a Catholic Christian. That's what it means to be a priest. And I just think that those are the parts, the witnesses we need to emphasize. That, that's, a quick, <laughs> that's a quick aside as we lead into some of these hero priests, you know, because as you mentioned, the Korean conflict, we have a hero priest. Received a Congressional Medal of Honor. Mm-hmm. In Vietnam, we have hero priests. You know, we have, the, of course, the exemplary ones during World War II that uh, sometimes even non-Catholics know just uh, as Americans, and sometimes our own Catholics don't know. <laughs> it's like, so uh, if I could just emphasize that overall, I think real importance that a book like this helps in terms of, of just regaining a sense of Catholic identity and, and a real sense of gratitude in being a part of the Roman Catholic Church. Oh yeah, no, because I mean, there's that book, When Sheep Attack, I think it is by a Protestant uh, cleric, uh, a friend of priest of mine spoke about that and even talks about how we use what's going on with the COVID things. Uh, uh, he was talking about if people keep, if laity keep attacking the clerics as they do, running them down in the hospital, uh, in air, airports, uh, yelling at them on social media, calling them names on social media. We got, you know, God will, has, there's no, he's not, hey, you, we, I, they owe, they're owed priests. He, we ain't owed anything. He can pull that out, and then we're stuck with nothing, or the sacraments are taken mm-hmm. away, and then people yes. get mad at priests again. They just, it's yeah, like you said, it's that American mindset. Uh, it's hard, but pray. I know th- th- too many people that know Father John, uh, uh, Father Martin as a good as a good guy or something like. That. Yes, he's preaching bad, but are you praying for him? Um, mm-hmm. Yes, he, right, exactly, and and, and I'll tell you. Um, more tragically, uh, just recently, uh, a priest friend in a different diocese from my own uh, who has begun the process to leave the priesthood, uh-huh. uh, he told me in, in conversations, he said, look, like I will fight every fight. I will take every scar in fighting the enemies of the church and find the atheists and so on. He said, but it just got tired. He goes, you know, not the fighting in the front. He said, what got tired was the, the knives in the back, uh-huh. you know, from our own, you know. Yeah. I don't agree with his decision, I, and I pray the Holy Spirit guides him elsewhere. But it just wore him down, mm-hmm. you know, when you're fighting so hard for the gospel and so far hard for the people of God, only to be stabbed in the back by your own, mm-hmm. you know. So I think that as, as Catholic members of the church, we have to really understand the importance of praying for our priests. So people say, well, I don't like my pastor. Well, maybe he doesn't like you either. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> this has never been about preferences or personality. I mean, yeah. You know, St. Paul says we have a bond by the Holy Spirit, you know, so uh, rally the cause, pray for him, support him. You might be surprised. So uh, I think in these areas, um, there's so much that we can all learn and be reminded of because it's easy to attack authority. We pride ourselves as Americans. We were born in revolution, a just revolution, uh, but that is in our spirit. Mm -hmm. And that can be a great benefit because we will fight for freedom and goodness. But sometimes that can be a burden, a hurt, a curse because we realize, wait a minute, sometimes I need to tone that down. Maybe I shouldn't be attacking this authority. Otherwise, we end up being like Gamaliel in the Acts of the Apostles when the Sanhedrin was attacking the Apostles. And he said, hey, in his wisdom, be careful because we continue to attack these men. We might find ourselves actually attacking God. Yeah. So I just think it's important. Again, our priests aren't perfect. They're not above reproach. But I just think that as Catholics, we have to regain a real just esteem and, and, and uh, cherishing of, of the priesthood. Like I became a priest because I felt called, but also because I knew that there was no greater gift given to the human family than the continuation of the priesthood of Jesus Christ. It's by that priesthood that we are saved. And to be called to serve in that way, mm-hmm. I can think of no greater good. 
So, and I hope that we retreat that as Catholics. It was uh, Dignities and Dignity and Duties of Priests by uh, St. Alphonsus. And uh, obviously that's for priests, but lady, I got a lot of that from just reading that as a layman going, holy cow, it's just the, again, the dignity of a priest. If you read that, you'll see a guy in a collar in a very different light. Yes, yes, amen, amen. And if I can bring in aspects of, of the military with this for, for a second, um, the viewers might appreciate this story. It's, it's related uh, to, the, to the topic of the book. Uh, when I went to the seminary, I was preparing for my ordination as a, a transitional deacon. That's the last step before a man is ordained a priest. Mm -hmm. And I went to the North American College, so we're actually ordained pre uh, deacons uh, at the altar of the chair in St. Peter's Basilica, which is that beautiful chapel behind the main canopy uh, of St. Peter's. And when my parents came over. My dad's a retired first sergeant in the army. Uh, you know, uh, you know, it's like a dog-faced soldier, as he would say. And um, and my, throughout my time in the seminary and 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 studies for the priesthood and various things, my father was very supportive. You know, like to place, you know, the common good over oneself, to place a greater service to God before one's uh, personal comfort, like right up his alley. Mm -hmm. But he shared with me, he said, the one thing that he struggled with, he says, you know, this you know, celibacy, he says, you know, I, I get it, like you go on your assignments, you go on your mission, you have to leave the things you love behind. Uh, you know, as Chesterton would say, we, the soldier fights not because he hates what's in front of him, but because he loves what is behind him, mm -hmm. you know? And so my father said, I, I get that, I get that. He said, but to come home and not have a family, you know, he says, you know, you do what you got to do. You know, and it's like, you, you know, you got, you have my support. But I could tell just in his own mind, his own heart, he, he kind of struggled with that. Mm -hmm. Well, then here comes my ordination. And Archbishop O'Brien, uh, later Cardinal O'Brien, who was the military archbishop, the archbishop of military services. Mm -hmm. So this is the archbishop who supervises the Catholic um, Catholic soldiers and sailors and Marines and so on. Right? So he comes to do the ordination. Now, at this time, he's doing the ordination in St. Peter's Basilica. My parents are with me. My brother is in Korea on uh, on that infamous border now between North and South Korea. Mm -hmm. Right? He can't attend uh, the ordination. And Archbishop O'Brien is preaching. Of course, many Catholics might not know, but the, um, the promise of celibacy is actually made when you're a deacon. Mm -hmm. It's later confirmed as a priest, but it's actually made when you're a transitional deacon. Mm -hmm. So the Archbishop's talking about all the different promises, prayer, simplicity of life, uh, obedience, and he gets to celibacy. And he starts to describe uh, a scene in battle where a unit's under attack and a grenade comes, you know, right in the middle of the unit. And one uh, soldier, without even thinking, uh, jumps on the grenade. And by uh, laying his body on the grenade, literally laying down his life, he saves his his comrade in arms. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he says, and the archbishop says, and that is what celibacy is. Mm -hmm. you know, like when the priest is willing to lay his life down, to jump on the grenade, so that others might live. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was moved by that example. <laughs> Later, someone said to me, because um, all the parents sat up front for the ordination, they said. Uh, he said, hey, uh, Kirby, uh, like your dad was like really into this the homily, right? I was like, really? <laughs> I mean, you know, my dad's attentive, but I would never say that he was really into a homily, right? And I'm like, really? And they're like, yeah, yeah. And he's like, hey, he was like shedding some real tears, you know? Did not sound like my dad. I'm like, I think he's got the wrong guy, right? Yeah. So later I asked my dad, I said, dad, were you moved by the homily, you know? And, you know, he's going to take possession of his emotions, even if he might be a little embarrassed by them. And he said, yeah, he said, when that archbishop said, Selvus is laying down on the, you know, throwing yourself down on the grenade, because I was very moved, you know. And my mom told me, like, he was, said, my dad was just crying, crying, crying. Because mm -hmm. he finally kind of clicked, like, why that's so essential, the priest's imitation of Christ to lay down his life, you know. So, incidentally, the archbishop found out about my brother, you know, he actually sent a copy of the program in a letter to my brother in Korea. Oh, wow. <laughs> that was awesome, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, my family was, they're like, you know, guess what? Um, your brother received the package from the archbishop. I'm like, oh, they're probably asking for money. <laughs> <laughs> but then, but I, I thought it was just like, a, you know, one of those general letters, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Like, you know. Yeah. 
And my mom said, no, no, he, he received a handwritten letter from the archbishop saying that, you know, he was uh, sorry that my brother couldn't be there, um, but and so on. You know, I, thought, I just thought that was a class act. That's awesome, yeah. But, uh, but so the story uh, in these, the, the accounts of the priests in the book, I mean, that's, you know, that's what we're talking about. Like, and, and as I tell that story, uh, I'm very inspired just to hear whatever priest is called to and then to see these hero priests play it out you know so um, so yeah so we can dive into some of them if you want uh, some of the more specifics but I, I just love books like this i'm grateful to tan to publish books like this a lot of catholic publishers won't um you know maybe it's not a large enough market or whatever the reason might be but i'm, I'm grateful that, that this book has seen the light of day and the, the viewers can read it Hey, we talk about, you know, movies that you could watch for your family or, or superheroes or the Avengers. And there's, there's a book you can read to your kid probably and give them some, you know, guess, you know, Catholic men. This is it's not wimpy. This is, this is what man is. We hear about guys like uh, the kicker from the Kansas City Chiefs. When he was in high school, he talked about an EW tennis conversion story about maybe going to Islam because they were manly. He, he couldn't find that when he was growing up in high school. There's a lot of what we lost in the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years on just being a guy. And, yes. Yeah. And we're not saying going out and starting a war is a guy thing, but these guys, they were, they weren't, they didn't start it, but they, so that others may live, followed yes. everyone else where their flock was going. They needed to be there. And as others chaplains would see, the Protestants, they saw the heroic virtue out of all these guys. Yes, yes. We used to speak in our spiritual tradition of a virile virtue, mm -hmm. and we would say it more popularly a manly virtue. Mm -hmm. And and it's that virtue that, when everything is off and all appears chaos, that a person holds to what they know is right, mm -hmm. what they ultimately believe. Because real virtue doesn't rely on the state of affairs of this world. Let the whole world burn. But as I know who I am, I know who I worship. I know in whom I follow, whom I trust, as St. Paul says, uh, and, and I will remain true to myself and to what I know and what is true. And that's what these men did, these, these Catholic chaplains. I mean, you know, in, in, in environments we just cannot imagine, you know, uh, the accounts of the chaplains of World War I when uh, poisonous gas is first introduced, they don't even know what it is. People are just dying, suffocating, going blind. You know, and what does a Catholic priest do? He starts rallying the cause. Take the ones who are suffering to the back, those organized, anoint the ones who are dying. He gives general absolution to those that he can't minister to. Like he took charge, right? He was probably just as scared, just as confused as everyone else. But he knew who he was and he knew what was expected of him and he did it, right? Mm -hmm. And that's across the board. Now that's in every vocation. That's fatherhood in the family, that's motherhood in the family, that's, <coughs> excuse me, it's being an employer, mm -hmm. you know, like over uh, an area of responsibility in the business world. Uh, and that is in every life, in every situation. When people look and say, well, I did that because I had, you know, a, a bad childhood. I did that because this person did this. I did that because these weren't the way, things weren't the way that I thought. Well, none of that is an excuse for vice. None of that is excuse for omission. So I, I think that these priests model priestly virtue manly virtue and i think that manly virtue could be imitated by all the faithful right so i mean it's like what we're called to be and i think in particular uh, men especially those who are called to be husbands and fathers we call it spiritual fathers as well are especially to exemplify this right i love in our tradition we say that you know that fatherhood one of the first tasks and responsibilities of fatherhood is to model virtue mm -hmm. So a father in his family, a spiritual father to his parish, is to model virtue, right? Mm -hmm. So I will not give in to preferences or, uh, or passions. I will not allow passing trends to strip what I know is right. I will hold the line. Right? So it's very important. We see our Catholic chaplains doing that throughout this book. And it's not a switch you just turn on. So many of these guys, they were living it from either early life or growing it before they even got there, obviously. You just don't flip a switch and say, all of a sudden I got virtue, right? Right, exactly. For example, Father Whalen, we are told about his outreach to the Andersonville uh, prison mm -hmm. and who went and 
you know, himself would say, like, I mean, the smell alone, like, you know, would provoke vomiting. You know, like, you know, all these thousands of, tens of thousands of prisoners beyond what that prison was built for. And what does he do? He does what a priest is expected to do. Right? I mean, he continues to minister, like, he just sucks it up. You know what I mean? Like, just, you know I mean? Yeah, it stinks. Yeah, like, this is terrible. People are dying. They're emaciated. Uh, but you are there. He knew that he was there in order to do that. That's just one example throughout the book. You know, we can also look at, you know, the World War II uh, heroes, you know, where uh, they were probably just as, as nervous or scared, uh, and yet they did what was what was expected, what their call, their vocation mm -hmm. demanded of them. What were some of the stories that stuck out to you as your favorites? Uh, like, like I said, most yeah. people know of Father Capel. Uh, I think I pronounced his name right. And Capodarno, but maybe they mm -hmm. don't. Maybe you can uh, can you go into a little bit more on them? Yeah, I think that you know, um, for any Catholic, they should definitely know the story of the Catholic story of Gettysburg uh, mm -hmm. with Father uh, Corby, who, um, of course, you know the the Irish Brigade, and the Irish Brigade was known for its fierceness, and it was placed purposely in. The worst possible environments because they were irish and at the time immigrants and so well catholic immigrant you know we don't really need them we'll put them in the worst place possible so you find the most dangerous places in a battlefield and that's where the irish brigade would be and uh and so during gettysburg the irish brigade was put in the worst possible situation they had already lost two thousand men they were down to around 500 and they were not allowed to recruit in order to get more men and they're putting this in just completely impossible situation. So Father Corby gets up right before and the famous stone uh, monument, actually, that, that's still preserved at, at Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. He gets up and all the men kneel and he gives general absolution to the men uh, in what they know is going to be just a devastating battle. And they all get up and receive their absolution. He leads them. He's with them as they begin to engage in battle. They lose over 200 men to brigade is down to a little under 50 by the time the battle's done, right? So I just had a powerful scene of this priest getting up and say, hey, like, <laughs> we know this stinks. We know what's about to happen, but you know what? Here's your absolution. You're good with God. Now let's like fight like Hades and, and, and do some good. And, and they did it, and he was with them where he should have been. And I just, I'm very moved by that, uh, that, that uh, sense of faith-filled heroism. Just to give a little more on how bad the Irish were treated over here, I remember reading a story about why is Harlan predominantly black? It's because when the Irish moved into that area, I think it was Manhattan, they looked at them as pond scum, the Irish, and they didn't want to have anything to do with it, so they all moved out there to Man to Harlem. They didn't want nothing to do with the Irish. So that's just to give you guys a little more example of how bad people thought of the Irish. Yes, yeah. I'm, even in, in my own state, in Charleston, the Irish were not allowed to live in Charleston, the city. They had to live out on the barrier islands. Mm -hmm. One of them was Sullivan's Island, which is funny because now this is like like prime real estate, right? Like, you know, you know um, Reese Witherspoon's owns property out there, and so on. You know, but at, back in the day, the Irish had to live on the island, and they literally had to like, you know, canoe in, you know, or boat themselves in uh, to the city in order to serve as domestics uh, to the homes of Charleston. So yeah, the Irish were, were very favorable because of their of their Irish status, but also because they were Catholic. Mm -hmm. I think that we've gotten so used to being accepted by American culture, we forget how hard we had to fight. Like we earned our status in American society. Oh, it wasn't yeah. a government program. It wasn't rallies. It wasn't destroying statues. It wasn't waging war against uh, our our new homeland. It was working hard, showing our virtue. It was showing people that hey, we hold what this nation holds dear in our own hearts. Uh, and I think we can sometimes forget that. People read these histories and say, wait a minute, like what? Like, it was basically illegal to be a Catholic priest in the colonies? Yes, and in the early states. Mm -hmm. Catholic worships, worship was unwelcomed and, and, and in some places made extremely difficult and, 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 and by extension, practically illegal. In many of our early states, yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Georgia. Yes. I mean, yeah, Georgia right. Created right. the buffer to keep the Catholics from going up the coast. Yes, and, and then Maryland's established Mary's land supposedly for the Catholics, and only to have it turned on the Catholic community, and you know Catholics become more, more persecuted in Maryland. Mm -hmm. So it, it, the stories go on, but you know, in terms of our, our Catholic identity, I think we have to know our history, 
and to realize that you know it was precisely this virtue that allowed us our place and in many respects it was the heroism of units like the irish brigade that showed america how committed catholics and the irish immigrants were to the united states and even past that one was the san patricios uh, down in the mexican wars Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Which is great. You literally have a group of Irish Catholics who established like the Legion of St. Patrick, the Patricios. It means like the Pat the Patricians, right? The Patrick people. I mean, this is great. You know? And uh, and they fight like Hades and they distinguish themselves, which is why they're recorded in history. So the the, the list goes on just in terms of, of the real Catholic identity and that Catholic fierceness. I, I I'm very moved when I read these accounts and you Hear about, for example, the the priest who goes, he serves as a chaplain, he comes back, and then, you know, he basically becomes the second founder of uh, Notre Dame University because the original one had burned to the ground. Or the chaplain who goes out and serves, he comes back, and he's the founder of Boston College. And these chaplains, these priests who create schools and orphanages and hospitals and universities, like, and and in large part they did that because they took our faith seriously. Mm-hmm. They took their vocation seriously, and they accomplished what anyone at that time would have thought was impossible. And I really pray that as a church, we begin to take ourselves more seriously, because I believe that God still has a great work for each of us and for our church. And I look for the day when Catholics begin to say, there's a problem, let's fix it. So let's build orphanages, let's build more homes for unwed mothers, let's do that real kind of fierceness that we have seen in those who were before us that I think in a lot of ways we've kind of become overly domesticated we've just gotten comfortable and and I don't think that that's helpful for us or the mission of our church what's a couple of other stories from the uh, book that really stuck out yes so I think that um, the one of course Father Duffy uh, his statue is actually in Times Square and uh, Father Duffy, of course, he goes out uh, there in World War II. Uh, he's there all in the, the you know, the, the Battle of the Bulge. He's, he's all in these, like, massive battles. And uh, his life, um, uh, I think it was either his life or one of the other chaplains he worked with, uh, was the impetus for the story, Saving Pri- the movie Saving Private Ryan. And, and of course, he was friends, uh, served alongside Father O'Neill, who wrote the famous prayer, the weather prayer of General Patton, that if you've seen the movie... Uh, Patton uh, is is described. It doesn't identify the chaplain as a Catholic priest, but he's a Catholic priest, Father O'Neill. But Father Duffy was kind of the leader, kind of larger than life, and not only uh, a chaplain among men, but a real man among chaplains. Mm-hmm. And comes back to the United States because <laughs> because of his experience in battle, they put him in the worst possible neighborhoods in New York, like Hell's Kitchen, all this, you know, just the worst of the worst, you know. And he just completely turns the place around. They said he patrolled his territorial parish as a police officer and might patrol uh, his territory, right, his his beat. And uh, and he took it seriously, and he brought about great reform. This is why his statue is in Times Square. I mean, and and again, just in the battlefield and then that virtue and those tactics and that strategy and then bringing it back to the worst of neighborhoods uh, in New York at the time and was able to bring about great reform and, and, and human flourishing I think that you know those are models. So he's one of those ones that, that's kind of larger than life. And if anyone ever goes to New York, especially Catholics, you, you've got to go to Times Square. And, of course, you have to make sure that you get a statue, a picture with the, the statue of Father Duffy. Where is it nearer than Times Square? Are you, uh, what area? It's actually right in the center. Oh. Like, I mean, it, yeah, so if you go right in the middle area, it, it's right there. Um, the only reason why someone might miss it is because of the, um, the amount of, of people in the square. But, but look for it, and, and you'll see it. Yeah, Incidentally. I, I know yeah. I was in Times Square once. For his, We were only there for the, the last week of Yankee Stadium, which, if anybody knows, it used to be on KFC property. Knights of Columbus <laughs> used to own that land for Yankee Stadium. The- yes, yes, yes. yes. And, and, and speaking of the Knights, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that they're, they're highlighted in the book, uh, if it was not for the Knights, we would not have had a Catholic chaplaincy in World War I. Because by the time we got to World War One, as Americans, we were isolationists. Uh, the majority of the country did not want to get involved into, in, in a European battle. Uh, when we were forced uh, to, to engage by the seeking of the Lusitania, um, 
you know, people weren't really thrilled the idea of having Catholics or Catholic priests mm -hmm. in the military. And really, the, Catholic, the Knights of Columbus organized basically a volunteer brigade of, of clergy. And the Knights of Columbus took care of their salaries and sent them out to war. So, yeah, the Knights, that's another fascinating history in terms of what they've been able to accomplish and the land they've owned and, and the movements they've inspired and the things that they have underwritten. Um, beautiful examples of kind of faith and tenacity. Oh, yeah, especially the Cristeros War. Uh, they were huge in that. Yes, and most people don't realize we have under God in our Pledge of Allegiance because of the Knights of Columbus. Mm -hmm. I, think 1950, that. I think that would happen. That's right, yep, yeah, exactly. So, so, I mean, powerful. And, the, and, you know, the Knights of Columbus, that's just uh, in, uh, one step from saying the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. I mean, because their work, of course, represents our faith. So uh, we have an adjustment to the Pledge of Allegiance under God because of the Catholic Church. We have these various uh, movements of goodness because of the Catholic Church and, and its entities, such as the Knights of Columbus. Uh, another one out of the book. So I'm not going to um, do I the think, whole book, uh, ladies and gentlemen. You got to get the book. <laughs> we'll just do it as snippets. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, and and and, and you know, and this is a good problem. The problem is that there are uh, so many positive ones. Uh, maybe this one can can help us. Uh, in terms of our own struggle with 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 venial sin, mm -hmm. that uh, Father Capon in during the Korean conflict, uh, one of our more uh, recent ones, mm -hmm. and is a recipient of, of the Medal of Honor. Um, he talks. Uh, he was in the POW camp. So he was there with his men, just as we've been describing. He's taken a prisoner. As many priests throughout the book are recounted are. are become prisoners of war that, that shocked us a little bit to imagine a priest as a prisoner of war but it happened mm -hmm. a lot and on this case father uh, Capon is in the POW camp with his men and selflessly serving organizing networks of service and various other things doing all the stuff that we'd expect a priest to be doing but the accounts of the men afterwards they say whoo he had a salty tongue <laughs> right so apparently uh he, he kind of had a, a filthy mouth <laughs> In, in the sense of, um, you know, bad language and stuff. He, you know, was using some uh, profanity and so on, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, and and I mentioned that first because it's in the book and I, I find it comical. But in context, I suspect that if he had not used that type of language, I don't know if he would have motivated the men uh, mm -hmm. at the time. So, and I'm sure that, you know, he struggled with venial sin as, as we all do. And just, I, I find it encouraging that someone who achieved such virtue and such holiness uh, struggled with these these sins, you know. Like you can you don't usually imagine that you know that there was a saint who struggled with profanity, but you know, I'm sure he had to motivate the men, and he wasn't afraid to use the language that was needed to do it. And if anybody's already condemning him to the fourth realm of hell, you weren't in the POW right. camp with them either, so it's, <laughs> right. Right, on, right. cut him a little bit of slack. I don't want, I, don't don't play the judgment. Don't play right. God. <laughs> exactly, exactly, and, and and in particular because I, I, I think we have never retrieved his body. I, I think he's still one of the lost bodies of the Korean conflict. Mm -hmm. So I know that you know a couple of years ago under um, President Trump's negotiation, several bodies were returned. Uh, Father Kapan was still not one of them. So oh, wow. I still don't think we have his body from that that conflict. I did not know. So that. yeah. So he, he he's a hero, and I think that he, <laughs> in light of all that he suffered, all the good he did, I think we can balance uh, and, and say, you know what? Uh, again, for me, I read it, I laughed, I thought oh, that's comical. It kind of gives me hope, you know, um, because sometimes I might struggle with some bad language, but um, but more importantly, I, I really think that he probably needed that language to rally the men. I mean, he was dealing with soldiers in. Uh, environments that led to starvation, malnutrition, mm -hmm. and so on. So anyway, I, I just thought that was an interesting fact. Yeah, he in, wasn't in hanging book. out at Toys R Us. It was... Right, 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 exactly. Right. It's kind of like one of our Southern writers, uh, Catholic Southern writers, Walker Percy, he says that there's virtue for the trenches and there's virtue for the front porch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have to make sure that, you know, the expression of our virtue, like it does change, right? Mm -hmm. Still the same virtue. But we can express things one way when we're sitting on the front porch, see, you know, sipping iced tea. And we express that virtue very differently when the trenches and their bombs being blown up over our heads. So uh, I think we can appreciate that. Yeah, no, it's kind of like how we treat everyone coming back from Vietnam. I mean, yeah, there were some terrible things 
that happened out there. But my dad burnt all his uh, uniform because he got tired of people spitting on him. Wow. And things like that. Uh, yes. Yeah, we have. No, I have one jacket from that from his time out there, and that's it. He never want to talk about it. Uh, people ask about going hunting. He would kill that conversation quick by saying, "Once you do human animals, isn't that much fun?" That usually went. Yeah. Yes. Nobody thinks that they look at the movies, how glorified everything is. Yes, and yes. They say war is hell for a reason, right? Exactly, exactly. And, and that was voice. I think General Sherman said that war is hell. Yeah. So um, you know, and 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 it is like that. I mean, of course, we only have accounts of of, of it, and I, I can't imagine. And and you know, those are the moments where it's easy to were saying earlier to sit and judge, you know, people in the moment, um, but. You know, understanding and trying to appreciate the state of affairs. You know, we say even in our moral tradition, even if there was a moral evil, uh, the state of affairs can certainly mitigate it, mitigate the guilt. You know, if there was an evil, because we just can't imagine. No. It is a, a hell on earth. Father, any final thoughts on the book besides go out and get it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say that. Um, if we could, uh, in, in memory of the author, say that, you know, this was one of the last books he wrote, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, he's of, of bad health. And it says a lot to someone who knows that his health is not good. And yet, of all the things he could write and the legacy that he could leave, uh, he chose uh, to allow this book uh, to be one of his last. And I think that says a lot in terms of his dedication to our faith and to the priesthood. And I think that speaks, I hope it speaks volumes to us in terms of how important this book is and its message yeah, amen to that yes uh, again these are real superheroes of the church uh voluntary they didn't i don't think they got drafted they voluntarily go don't they that's right exactly yeah so i mean there, there you go i mean you got captain america these are real captain americas <laughs> amen well, father appreciate your time thanks steve take care take appreciate it